So this morning we're very happy to welcome once again Swami Maidananda, who will be speaking on Holy Mother Sarada Devi as a philosopher. Swami Maidananda is a monk of the Ramakrishna Order and Senior Research Fellow in Philosophy at the Vedanta Society of Southern California. He serves as Hindu chaplain at both UCLA and the University of Southern California, where he teaches a weekly class on the Bhagavad Gita. He received his PhD in German aesthetics from the University of California, Berkeley, and is the recipient of several awards and fellowships across the world. The Swami is an expert in cross-cultural philosophy, especially on Ramakrishna Vivekananda thought, Vedanta philosophy, scriptural hermeneutics, and the philosophy of Sri Aurobindo. As well as being the author of innumerable papers and articles, in the last few years, Swami Maidananda has authored three major books, The Dialectics of Aesthetic Agency, Reevaluating German Aesthetics from Kant to Adorno, Infinite Paths to Infinite Reality, Sri Ramakrishna, and Cross-Cultural Philosophy of Religion. And most recently, his highly acclaimed work, Swami Vivekananda's Vedantic Cosmopolitanism. Swami, we are very happy to welcome you again. Om Jananim Saradam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagatgurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Muhur Muhu Having taken refuge at the lotus feet of Holy Mother Sri Sharada Devi and Sri Ramakrishna, the Guru of the entire universe, we prostrate ourselves before them again and again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you to Diane for the very generous introduction and my virtual pranams to revered Swami Sarvapriya Nandaji Maharaj, who is not here today because at this very moment he's giving a Sunday talk. I don't know if he's at this moment, but in any case, he's giving a talk at, at the Providence Center. Um, but, he's, but his presence is felt here by everyone, and I apologize if you're disappointed that he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that probably happens a lot. Um, okay, so this is my, the third lecture I'm giving here, I'm honored to say, uh, at the Vedanta New York Center, and all three are kind of of a piece, and I wanted to begin by explaining that a little bit. So I see this lecture as the third part of what might be called my Vigyana Vedanta trilogy of lectures. Okay. Starting with the lecture I gave when I was wearing white rather than Girua, 2018, November, I came here as a young brahmachari. Hopefully I'm still somewhat young. <laughs> and uh, the talk was on infinite paths to infinite reality. That was based on my book on Sri Ramakrishna. And what I'm, what I'm doing in all three of these lectures, the one I gave in 2018, the one I gave last year um, on Swami Vivekananda's philosophy based on my new book, and what I'm doing today in my lecture on Holy Mother Sharada Devi as a philosopher, is I'm introducing a new philosophical paradigm for understanding our great spiritual tradition. Why new? What's new about it? In the past, all of the philosophical schools of Vedanta have been sectarian or narrow in some way. And what I see as one of the most important contributions that our tradition makes, the reason for the advent of the Ramakrishna incarnation, and that Ramakrishna incarnation includes Holy Mother Sharada Devi and Swami Vivekananda, they're all of a piece, is that they taught a philosophy, a spiritual philosophy that's broader than any of the existing schools, and because it was broader than any of the existing schools, it was able to harmonize the different schools of Vedanta. This Vigyana Vedanta philosophy of Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother Sharada Devi, and Swami Vivekananda is a harmonizing philosophy. It's a broad philosophy that harmonizes all of the existing schools of Vedanta. So let me uh, begin by summarizing how, it, how, I th how I see it as a harmonizing philosophy. I think that'll give us really useful context for then 
thinking about Holy Mother as a philosopher. First big philosophical question, what is the nature of ultimate reality? What is the nature of ultimate reality? According to Shankara's school of Advaita Vedanta, let's call it classical Advaita Vedanta, the ultimate reality is only nirguna. He often uses the term nirvishesha, but it means the same thing. Impersonal, without attributes, from the ultimate standpoint. Non-dual, pure consciousness. According to Ramanuja's Vishta Dvaita school of Vedanta and Madhva's Dvaita school of Vedanta, they say exactly the opposite of Shankara. They say that Brahman is only Saguna and not Nirguna at all. Brahman is only Vishnu Narayana, the personal god, and we don't accept even the very reality of Nirguna Brahman, which Shankara is talking all the time about. But there are other schools of Vedanta which occupy a kind of middle position. Achinta Bheda Bheda Vedanta, the school of Chaitanya and his followers, and Vallabha school of Shuddha Dvaita Vedanta, it's very interesting, even the name Shuddha Dvaita is a polemical term used by one of his followers. It means pure non-dualism. Pure as opposed to what? The impure non-dualism of Shankara school. So I'm not going to go into that, but it's an interesting point. So anyway, what do they say? Achinta Bheda Bheda Vedanta and Shuddha Dvaita say, we accept the reality of both Nirguna Brahman and Saguna Brahman. Shankara is Nirguna, wonderful. Ramanujan and Madhva is Saguna Brahman, we accept that too. But there's a catch with these schools as well. They say that there's still a hierarchy. The highest, greatest, most comprehensive reality is Krishna, the supreme person. And Brahman, and when they mean Brahman, these two schools, Ajinta Bheda Bheda and Shuddha Dvaita Vedanta, when they say Brahman, they're thinking of non-dual pure consciousness. They say that's just a minor aspect, almost a kind of negligible aspect of Krishna. The Sanskrit term here is, uh, is Tanubha. The peripheral brilliance of Krishna is none other than Shankara's Brahman. So there's still a hierarchy, and if jnanis want to focus on Brahman, let them, but they're missing out on Krishna, who is, you know, a much bigger deal. All right. So, that, so what does Sri Krishna say? Sri Krishna says, Jini nirgun tini shogun. That divine reality which is nirguna is also saguna. That reality which is impersonal, non-dual pure consciousness is also the personal God manifesting in various forms, Kali, Krishna, Shiva, and so on and so forth. And unlike Achinta Bheda Bheda Vedanta and Shuddha Dvaita Vedanta, he doesn't bring in hierarchies. He doesn't say that somehow uh, non-dual pure consciousness is higher than the personal God. He doesn't say that the personal God is higher than impersonal Brahman. He puts them all on an equal footing. Another one of his famous teachings, Brahmo o Shukti Abhed. Brahman, meaning non-dual pure consciousness, and Shakti, the personal God, are inseparable but equally real and equally valuable aspects of one and the same infinite divine reality. Swami Vivekananda says exactly the same thing. That's why in my last lecture I talked about what I call his integral Advaita philosophy. I mean the same thing exactly as Vigyana Vedanta, but I wanted to emphasize the fact that it's still an Advaita. It's an Advaitic philosophy. Don't, don't have the mistaken impression that Vigyana Vedanta is somehow dualistic or not Advaitic. It's 100% Advaita. But it's an Advaita that includes the reality of this world and the individual souls and the personal God. It's an all-inclusive, all-comprehending Advaita Vedanta. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Shab Jodhya Ekti in Bangla, which means it's a oneness that encompasses everything. Swami Vivekananda used to teach the same thing. He said, impersonality includes all personalities. It's a very unique teaching. Impersonality includes all personalities. This is very much in line with Sri Ramakrishna's teaching. And in other places, we Hindus teach that God is personal, impersonal. Exactly like Sri Ramakrishna is teaching. And we're about to see in my lecture today uh, where Holy Mother stands on these things. But that's the first big issue, the nature of ultimate reality. Sri Ramakrishna and Swamiji beautifully harmonize all of the different existing traditional views on the nature of ultimate reality by embracing God as this vast, infinite reality which is not only impersonal but also personal. Second big philosophical question is the world real or unreal? Very controversial. Shankara's classical Advaita Vedanta holds that names and forms only have provisional reality. They're real from the empirical standpoint. What does he mean by empirical, Vyavaharika? He means the standpoint of ignorance. So long as you do, do, uh, you're unaware of Brahman, then we see this reality, the, we accept the reality of all these names and forms. The chairs you're sitting on, the very people in front of me, me, 
and so on, the podium. But when you realize Brahman, what happens? You realize that these forms, names and forms never existed at all. What example does he use? The rope snake analogy, famous classical Advaitic analogy. He says, I'm walking, he says, imagine you're walking down a road and you think you see a snake, so you jump away in fright. And then after some time, you see it's not moving at all. And then you move closer and you think it might be a dead snake. And then you move even closer, you say, wait a minute, it's just a rope. So what happened that whole, was there ever a snake? No, we mistakenly thought there was a snake. There was never a snake at any time, but because of my stupidity, my ignorance, my foolishness, I thought there was a snake. In fact, there was the rope all along, exactly in the same way. We stupidly think we're sitting here and listening to a lecture, but I'm not here, you're not here, there's only Brahman, non-dual pure consciousness. <laughs> this is Shankara's view. Ramanuja, his school of Vishtadvaita Vedanta and other bhakti schools of Vedanta, so some of the other schools I mentioned earlier, they all hold that the world is real. Now, what is Sri Ramakrishna's position? And again, notice how beautifully he harmonizes different views. There is a place in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, in the original Bengali, where he says that Shankara's Advaita is true and Ramanuja's Vishishta Advaita Vedanta is also true. He, sa he, has, he says this exact sentence. In what sense? What he says is, both of their philosophies correspond to two distinct stages of spiritual experience which he calls jnana and vijnana, respectively. Shankara's school of classical Advaita Vedanta corresponds to what he calls jnana. What does he mean by it? He uses a nice analogy of a staircase and a roof. He says, imagine that I'm climbing the stairs, try to, trying to get to the roof. And he says that in that process of climbing up the stairs, I, I engage in this process of neti neti vichara. Not this, not this. Brahman is not these stairs. Brahman is not this. Brahman is not that. Until I reach the roof. We reach the roof. That signifies nirvikalpa samadhi for Sri Ramakrishna. That is the knowledge, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Non-dual, pure consciousness alone is real. Everything else is, is illusory. It's unreal. That's what he calls jnana. But it doesn't end there. Then he says, but there are some really unique souls. He calls them in other places Ishvara Kotis. It's a special category of jiva, of soul, which, which is divinely commissioned to come back to this world. These people can come back from the state of Nirvagava Samadhi and attain the state of what he calls Vigyana. And what's special about that realization? He says, instead of dismissing this world as unreal, Vigyani, Vigyani Dekhe Jini Nirgun Tini Shogun. The Vigyani sees that that reality, that Brahman, which is nirguna, impersonal, is also personal, is also shakti. Not only that, Vigyani dekhe brahmoi chotur bingshi tatto haichan. The Vigyani sees that that shakti, that Brahman, has become everything in this world, all 24 cosmic principles. And he says, so that Vigyani sees that the stairs are made of the same material as the roof, bricks, lime, and brick dust the very same materials that the roof is made of, the stairs are made of. So that's also God. Why don't we see that as God as well? That's the Vigyani's realization. That's the difference. And he says, notice how Shankara's philosophy, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya, the world is unreal, pure consciousness alone is real, corresponds to the state of Jnana, reaching the roof, dismissing the world as unreal. But the further stage in spiritual realization, Vigyana, corresponds to Ramanuja's philosophy. Because Ramanuja sees this world as part of God, as a manifestation of God. Now you might say, well, are you saying that Sri Ramakrishna was a follower of Ramanuja? I'm not. Some people claim that. Interestingly, one of the people, one of the most vocal people in favor of the view that Sri Ramakrishna was a follower of Ramanuja was the author of the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> and most people don't know this. Why? Because they don't read the original Bengali, Kathamrita, and Nikhilanji omitted this, this passage <laughs> from, from the original Bengali. There's a place where M. Mohanana Gupta says, Takud, Sri Ramakrishna was not a follower of Shankara's classical Advaita because he didn't dismiss this world as unreal. He was a follower of Ramanuja. Why? Because he accepted, he used the analogy of a bale fruit. It's a special kind of fruit that you find very commonly in India. Sri Ramakrishna says, you don't get the full weight of the bale fruit unless you take, if, if you just take the pulp, you need to take the, the weight of the shell as well, the rind, all, everything. So, M thought, so this is good evidence, and because, so he accepted the world as real, as a real manifestation of Shakti, so isn't he a follower of Ramanuja? 
I think not. I, I have a separate lecture on this. If you're interested, you can kind of look it up, uh, Medananda Ramanuja on YouTube. But in any case, the, what it, why is Sri Ramakrishna not a follower of Ramanuja either? Because remember what I said earlier with regard to this question of what is the nature of ultimate reality. Ramanuja and Madhva say that Brahman is only Saguna, not Nirguna at all. Whereas Sri Ramakrishna fully accepts the reality of both the personal and the impersonal. That's a crucial philosophical difference. But my lecture is not about Sri Ramakrishna, it's about Holy Mother, so let's try to get to it quickly. But before I do, one more point. Spiritual practice. Which of the yogas leads to the highest spiritual goal of liberation? Massively controversial question in the traditional schools. Every single one of the traditional schools of Vedanta privileges one yoga over all the others. Shankara school privileges Jnana Yoga, as all of you know. The path of knowledge. The Bhakti schools of Vedanta, not surprisingly, privilege which yoga? Bhakti Yoga. <laughs> Very good. You can say it in unison. And poor Karma Yoga. Poor Karma Yoga is always the odd man out, all, all, odd person out, and is always sort of a lower practice in all of these schools. But Ramanuja is very interesting. He just flips the tables on Shankara and says, Bhakti Yoga is the direct path. And Jnana Yoga is a kind of good preparatory discipline, but it's for inferior aspirants. <laughs> OK, anyway, so what does Sri Ramakrishna say? He says, each one of these yogas is a direct path to liberation, whatever floats your boat. Swami Vivekananda says exactly the same thing. I'm going to quote directly from one of his books. Vivekananda says, each one of our yogas is fitted to make man perfect, even without the help of the others, because they have all the same goal in view. The yogas of work, karma yoga, of wisdom, jnana yoga, and of devotion, bhakti yoga, are all capable of serving as direct and independent means for the attainment of moksha. Now, as I promised, now we have to get to the topic of this lecture. Holy Mother Sharada Devi as a philosopher. Where does Holy Mother stand on these very controversial philosophical issues? This seeming housewife who spent most of her day cutting vegetables and making chapatis for Sri Ramakrishna and the devotees. It's all outward appearance. She was Saraswati herself. How do we know this? Sri Ramakrishna himself said so to Golapma. He said, referring to Holy Mother Sharada Devi, O Sharada Saraswati. Holy Mother is Mother Saraswati herself, Saraswati herself. She has come to give knowledge to all of humanity, not just to cut vegetables and make food for us. But even though no, none other than Sri Ramakrishna declared that Holy Mother came to give knowledge, as far as I'm aware, there's very, very little discussion of Holy Mother as a philosopher. And even though we talk about Sri Ramakrishna's philosophical teachings and Swami Vivekananda's philosophical teachings, we don't usually talk about Holy Mother's philosophical teachings, rarely. In fact, I've only come across a single article on Holy Mother as a philosopher. It's a wonderful article, which unfortunately is written in Bangla. So for those of you who don't know Bangla, won't be able to read it, but I'll just mention it. There's a compilation, there's an edited volume called Shotorupe Sharada. And there's a beautiful article in there written by Swami Pragyanananda called Gyanodayini, which literally means a giver of knowledge. So he, look, even in the title of the article, Gyanodayini, he's, he's referring to Sri Ramakrishna's statement about Holy Mother, that she came to give knowledge. She was a giver of philosophical knowledge and spiritual knowledge. And it's a beautiful article. I strongly recommend that you all read it. I've drawn, I've drawn from it myself in two respects. Number one, he does a very convincing he makes a very convincing case that Holy Mother's philosophy is best understood as Vigyana Vedanta. He doesn't use that term, but very much in the same way, in the same line of interpretation that I'm defending. And we'll see in more detail how he does so later in my lecture. And second, he was a brilliant researcher, so he really poured over all of the existing Bengali literature on Holy Mother and her teachings. And he, he really found, he found some teachings I had never heard of. So I, this is really a treasure, this article. And I'll, I'll point to some of these teachings, which at least I haven't heard of. And maybe some of you have, but I bet most of you have not heard of some of these teachings that I'm going to quote to you today in the context of my lecture. So uh, the one secondary article I found in any language on Holy Mother Sharada Devi as philosopher is Swami Pragyananandaji's article, Gyanodayini in Shwatarupa Sharada. So I draw on that. 
but I, I don't just slavishly follow it. I have my own ideas, but uh, I do draw on it. And secondly, in terms of primary texts, I use a wonderful, again, Bengali text called Sri Mahabhashito. It's a massive volume. Why is it so massive? Because it's a compilation of more or less all of Holy Mother's teachings, not just philosophical teachings, but teachings, organized thematically on, you know, on different topics. It's re and it's rigorously researched, and it gives the citation, the source, for every single one of the teachings. So it's very useful and very comprehensive. So I use that for my main primary text. And um, the, the, this lecture that I'm giving, um, hopefully this will turn into an article in the future, an academic article on Holy Mother's philosophy. You might ask, why only article? Why not a book? Because I've just written books on, on, on Sri Ramakrishna and a book on Swami Vivekananda. Why not a book on Holy Mother? I would love to. And if Holy Mother, Holy Mother is Shakti herself, so if she wills, then of course it'll happen. But with my limited intelligence, this is what I understand, and this is the reason why, for the foreseeable future, I see myself writing an article rather than a book. The reason is this. Something like 98% of Holy Mother's teachings, unfortunately, have been lost to humanity. They went unrecorded. Sri Ramakrishna had M. Mohanan Gupta, a triple master's degree, uh, somebody who had a kind of photographic memory, who years after he met, you know, had these encounters with Sri Ramakrishna, could remember by going into deep meditation exactly what these different, who these visitors were, what they asked Sri Ramakrishna, exactly what Sri Ramakrishna said in response, and therefore we have this amazing text called Sri Sri Ramakrishna Kothamrita, the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Swami Vivekananda had Goodwin, a professional stenographer, trained to memorize lectures and, and to write them word for word. And so we have the nine volume complete works. Who did Holy Mother have? She, she, she didn't have somebody to faithfully record her teachings. And that's a great loss to humanity. It's unfortunate, but it's a fact that we have to deal with. We have much less literature, much less volume on Holy Mother's teachings. So that's part of the reason why. At least for the foreseeable future, I see an article rather than a book. So please don't bug me about it. Uh, OK, uh, so now, to give you a, a heads up on, on this lecture and its structure, uh, it has three sections. In the first section, I want to make the case that Holy Mother fully accepted and taught none other than the philosophy of Vigyana Vedanta, taught also by Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda. That won't come as any surprise to any of you that I'm arguing for this. You may disagree with it, but that's me. Second section of this lecture, I'm going to address what I take to be some of the most obvious objections to my interpretation of Holy Mother Sharada Devi as a Vigyana Vedanta and try to uh, respond to these objections to kind of uh, anticipate some things that you might ask me. In the third and final section, I want to make the case that Holy Mother didn't just repeat what Sri Ramakrishna taught or what Swami Vivekananda said, but that she had some very original philosophical ideas as well. This section is going to be fairly short, and um, I'll only emphasize three original teachings of hers, but there are many more, which I'm not going to discuss today just because I don't have the time. So let's begin with, as I said, section one, which is Holy Mother Shara Devi also taught Vigyana Vedanta. Let me parse her teachings into five main doctrines. And the correspondences with Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana Vedanta, as I just explained in the beginning of this lecture, should be obvious. First, she maintained, following Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda, that the infinite divine reality is impersonal, nirguna in one aspect, and saguna, shakti, or the personal God, in another aspect, and much more besides. Where does she say this? Swami Pragyananji, in his beautiful article, Jnana Daini, he refers to an incident when a young man comes to Holy Mother and sort of hints to her without saying it directly. You can't directly say things like this to your future guru. So he says, he kind of hints to her, I really want you to give me the Shiva and Shakti mantra, the mantra of both, Shiva and Shakti. But she decides to only give him the Shakti mantra. And what does she say as her reason? She says... Can Shakti ever exist without Shiva? So I'm giving you Shakti mantra, that includes Shiva. Brahma Shakti Abhed. This is almost word for word what Sri Ramakrishna taught. Brahman and Shakti are inseparable. 
Non-dual pure consciousness and the personal God are inseparable but equally real aspects of the same infinite divine reality. Second doctrine about the world. Remember this big question, is the world real or unreal? I think she follows Sri Ramakrishna on the basis of her own, not, she's not just an intellectual philosopher, she had the spiritual realization of Vigyana, she was Saraswati herself. She realized that there's nothing in this world but God. Everything in this world, another, the positive way of putting it, all names and forms are real manifestations of Shakti. In one place she says, Tini Jeep Jagat Shabi Hoichin. Exactly the same language that Sri Ramakrishna used to use. Brahman has become absolutely everything in this world. All 24 cosmic principles. She says the same thing on another occasion. There was a female devotee who had these visions of divine forms. And Holy Mother says this in response. She says, Aha, she anonda kiya roj roj hoema. Yes, that bliss of seeing forms of God. Do, you, do, you, do people enjoy that bliss all the time, daily? Shab shotti, shab shotti, kichu mitha noema, uni shab. All of these visions you're having are all real. All these forms of God are real. Uni shab, God. And by God, she means Sri Ramakrishna because her whole, she saw her husband as God himself. Sri Ramakrishna has become everything. God has become everything. Then she adds, Uni prakriti, uni purush, un hote shabhabe. God is prakriti. Is all, everything we see here as insentient matter. God, uni purush. God is also all the purushas. Purusha here means all the sentient individual souls, all the jivas in this world. Un hote shabhabe. From God comes everything. And everything is God. It's a really radical kind of what's called panentheism, which means every single thing in this world is God. And God is beyond this world. That's the difference between panentheism and pantheism. Pantheism is God is exhausted by this world. Panentheism is God is everything in this world. This world is God, but God is also beyond this world. It's also transcendent, beyond the world. Okay. And in our daily life, we find the same thing. We find, there's an incident when one monk was treating a cat very roughly. He thought, it's a cat, so why even? Well, you know, it's not a human being, so I'm not doing anything wrong. Holy Mother scolds him and says, hey, God is in the cat too. There's this, and, and there are many incidents like this, where she reminds people to remember that absolutely everything and everyone is God, and we should see everything in that light. Third doctrine. Remember, this is a question of spiritual paths. Which one is higher, which one is lower? And just as Sri Ramakrishna and Swamiji didn't go into this game of higher and lower, Holy Mother also basically taught in her own way, Jotomot Tatopat, as many fades, so many paths. Here again, I'm very grateful to Pragyananji in his article, Gyanadayani, because he pulled out a teaching on the harmony of religions, which I had never heard of. And I bet many of you, I asked Sabra Piyanji just uh, 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 an hour or two ago whether he's heard of this Jesus. He said, no, I've never heard of it. So let me read it in Bangla as usual, and then I'll translate it. Holy Mother says, Brahma shakol bostu te achen. Tabe ki jano, shadu purushara shab achen manushke pot tekhate. Ek ek jone ek ek rakomet bol bolen. Pot onek, she jono tade shakolet kothai shotto. Jemon ekta gache shada, kalo, lal, nana rakomet paki eshe boshe horek rakomet bol bolche. Shunte binno holeo, shakol guli ke amra pakir bol boli. Ektai pakit bol ar onno gulo pakit bol noi eru bolina. I bet most of you in this room have never even heard of this teaching. Let me first translate it roughly. This is my very approximate translation. She says, Brahman is in all things and in all creatures. But great realized souls give different teachings. They're different. They don't all say the same thing. They give different teachings to different people. Since there are many paths to the same goal, all of their teachings are true. And then she gives a beautiful analogy which I'd never heard of. Imagine, for instance, that there's a tree with birds of different colors, white, black, red. And they are all chirping in different ways. The Bangla here is bol. Ch they all have different chirps. Different songs, different tunes, different, they're, they're chirping at different octaves. We don't, then I'll, I'll just finish the translation. We don't say that only one of these birds' chirps is really a bird's chirp. And that the sounds made by other birds are not birds' chirps at all. We say that every single one of these sounds made by all of these birds are birds' chirps. 
So this is a very unique analogy, which I'd never heard of, and I think it's really nice. So it's, it's really philosophically profound, I think. So what she's saying is every single religious teacher, every founder of a, of a spiritual philosophy is a realized soul, no doubt about it. They've all realized God in some form or aspect, and they're giving teachings on the basis of their realization. Remember Sri Ramakrishna's analogy of the blind men and the elephant? Every single one of the blind men is touching a, a part of the elephant. That means they're making contact. So, I mean, in the, we can think about it as each one of them is a realized soul. It's not that they're not touching the elephant. And they're touching a real aspect of the elephant. Their description is accurate. But they're wrong in generalizing about what aspect they're, they're, they're touching and thinking that the elephant is just the trunk or the elephant is just the toe or the elephant is just the, the, the bushy tail, right? So Holy Mother likewise is saying that, first of all, that they're differently colored birds, which means that these might be birds belonging to different religious traditions, different religious paths, and each of them is making different chirping sounds, which means that they don't all say the same thing. They're giving different teachings, but they're all chirps. We don't say that one is a chirp and the others are not chirps. In the same way, we say all of these realized souls are referring to different forms and aspects of one and the same infinite divine reality. Okay. Now, I can imagine the skeptics in the room and maybe online might say, but wait a minute, Holy Mother is also famous for downplaying the harmony of religions. Where does she do so? Let me read you this famous statement she made. Tini, meaning Sri Ramakrishna, Tini je motlob kore shamanai prochar kore chen, ta kintu amar mona hoi na. Tini tagir bhabi dekhiye chen, prochar kore chen. Holy Mother says, many of you are probably familiar with this teaching, I don't think Sri Ramakrishna intentionally set out to prove and teach the harmony of religions. Right? Many of you are aware of this. And then she says, let me continue the translation. I don't think that. He, his primary mission was to demonstrate absolute renunciation and teach that. Now, you might think, so, okay, so then she's not really emphasizing the harmony of religion so much. But no. I think there's a really subtle philosophical point she's making here, which I think is easily missed. What is she saying? I think she's saying this. Sri Ramakrishna was the ideal embodiment of renunciation of all forms, not just renunciation of lust and greed and worldly attachments and worldly desires, but renunciation also of sectarianism and bigotry and narrowness and one-sidedness. Ekodeshi Bhav in Bangla, you would say, this one-sidedness. Because his renunciation was so complete, he had to renounce any narrow, any limited conception of God. So the moment he realized God is Kali, what did he do? Did he just sit still and say, well, I'm done now? No. He told Divine Mother Kali herself, I'm not through with you. Now you have to, sh I want to relish you in various forms and aspects. This is recorded in the Lila Prashanga, in uh, Sharadana's biography of Sri Ramakrishna. Then he went on to practice many different religious paths, Christianity, Islam, many paths within Hinduism, Shaktism, uh, Vaishnavism, Advaita Vedanta, and he realized God in so many different forms and aspects, right? So what Holy Mother is seeing, it took somebody of her Saraswati kind of genius to realize this, that even his teachings on the harmony of religions are based on absolute renunciation. But it's renunciation of sectarianism and one-sidedness and narrowness and bigotry. And again, if we look at her life, because every single aspect of her life directly embodies and reflects her philosophical teachings. Amjad, this, you know, this Muslim person, uh, she said, Amjad is also my son. She embraced him as her own son, just as much as Sharat is. Sharadananda, who is her beloved, you know, who, who lived with her for so long and served her so lovingly. Who is this Muslim Amjad? She says, he's equally my son. <laughs> just imagine the broadness of her mind. Sister Nivedita came from foreign land. And some people were worried she's a traditional Orthodox Brahmin widow and how she might interact. She interacted with her like she was her, her own daughter. Harmony of religions in her own life on a day-to-day -day basis. Fourth doctrine that Holy Mother held, uh, very much in line with both Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda, what is the nature of post-mortem salvation for those who are fortunate enough to be liberated? What happens to them? And Sri Ramakrishna used to teach that there are two basic paradigms of salvation, which he, in a very in his inimitably charming way, um, likened to eating sugar and becoming sugar. So Advaitins want to become sugar. They want to just merge into, even merging is not quite right from an Advaitic standpoint. They want to just be 
the reality which is non-dual pure consciousness, like the salt doll that melts into the ocean, becoming sugar. Bhaktas don't want that. Devotees want to eat sugar. Bhaktora chini hote chai na chini khete chai, Sri Ramakrishna says. Bhaktas don't want to become sugar, they want to eat sugar. What does that mean? It means they want to commune eternally with the personal God in a loving relationship, in a higher loka, in an eternal heaven. Sri Ramakrishna, what's his position on this? There's a very interesting incident recorded in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna from May 23rd, 1885, when a staunch follower of Shankara's classical Advaita, Mohima Chakraborty, a householder devotee, says to Sri Ramakrishna, I have a question to ask, sir. A bhakta needs nirvana sometime or other, doesn't he? Bhakta erak kale tu nirvana chai. See, he's thinking of Shankara's philosophy, according to which there's no such thing as an eternal heaven for bhaktas. At best, there's what's called Brahma Loka, which is a kind of temporary realm where people can stay, commune with the personal God for some time, but ultimately you've got to merge into the absolute non dual pure consciousness. You can't stay there forever. Sorry, guys. Sri Ramakrishna says in response, so, so Mohima Chakraborty is asking, but bhaktas then also ultimately have to attain this advaitic state of becoming sugar rather than eating sugar. They can't just eat sugar all the time. They're going to get cavities. <laughs> That's my addition. I'm just joking. Okay. Sri Ramakrishna then says, it cannot be said that bhaktas need nirvana. There is a state in which the eternal Krishna is with his eternal bhaktas. Nitto Krishna ta nitto bhakto. Krishna is consciousness embodied and his abode also is consciousness embodied. Chinmoy sham chinmoy dham. Dhamma, the eternal lokas themselves are nothing but divine consciousness. They're eternal. Krishna is eternal and the bhaktas also are eternal. Nitto Krishna nitto bhakto. Nitya Krishna nitya bhakta. The, the forms of the personal God are eternal. The devotees of the personal God can also be eternal in these higher heavens, which last forever. It's a direct contradiction with classical Advaita Vedanta. What was Holy Mother's position? Exactly the same as Sri Ramakrishna's. Depending on who she, whom she was speaking with, she would modify her teachings accordingly and explain the ideal accordingly. Uh, for instance, in one place, she would say, Maya katiya katiya nirban hobe, bhagavane mishe jabe, bhagavane mishe jabe. As you, as you cut the bonds of maya, of worldliness and ignorance and bondage, ultimately you attain nirvana. She uses the word nirvana, the same term that Mohima Chakraborty uses in his question to Sri Ramakrishna. Bhagavane mishe jabe, that bhakta will even will, after attaining nirvana, he'll actually become one with, he or she will become one with God. Seems to be becoming sugar. But never generalize Holy Mother's teachings or Sri Ramakrishna's teachings or Swami Vivekananda's teachings for that matter, anybody's, on the basis of isolated teachings. This is a very important thing to keep in mind. Whenever you interpret somebody's philosophical ideas, you have to be comprehensive. You have to take into account all of their teachings and try to harmonize them, reconcile all of them. So let's look at other places. To other people, she taught exactly the opposite ideal. Let me give you an example. Some, a, a devotee asks her in Bangla, tu nirban mukti chaina, tadir ki hobe? This devotee, because he might have even, he or she might have heard her talking about nirvana as an ideal. This question is, but many people, these bhaktas don't want nirvana, so what happens to them? It's a very specific question, very pointed question. Opposite of Mohima Chakraborty's question is Sri Ramakrishna. This is Umesh Babu who's asking the question, by the way. Holy Mother says in response, Shononai nitto krishna nitto bhakto? Haven't you heard Nitya Krishna Nitya Bhakti? The same words that Sri Ramakrishna used in his response to Mohima Chakraborty. Krishna is eternal and the Bhakta is also eternal. Then she continues. She bhabe tara thakbe. She bhabe tara thakbe. Tomade bhoi ki. Tomade junne thakud Ramakrishna lok toidi korechen. Such a beautiful teaching. She's saying those Bhaktas who want to eat sugar rather than become sugar, She bhabe tara thakbe. They will dwell with the personal God in an eternal heaven. And then she says, because she knew that Umesh Baba was a de devotee of Sri Ramakrishna, she said, Sri Ramakrishna created Ramakrishna Loka for you guys. Literally, she says it. Thakur, tumade junne Thakur Ramakrishna lok toidi korechen. What a beautiful statement. This is again something very unique to Holy Mother. Swamiji didn't say this, as far as I'm aware. And Sri Ramakrishna was so humble as a child of God, he would never have said that. But Holy Mother said it. Sri Ramakrishna created a special eternal heaven called Ramakrishna Loka for his devotees, specifically de designed for you. Okay. 
Fifth doctrine of Holy Mother's Vigyana Vedanta has to do with ethics and spiritual practice. Five days before Holy Mother left her body in 1920, she said the following very famous words. Almost all of you will know this, but there's a lot of philosophical depth behind this that I think needs some unpacking. Ekti kotha boli, jodi shanti chao ma karo dosh dekho na, dosh dekbe nijer, jagot ke apnaar kore nite shekho, keo pod noe ma jagot tomar. If you want peace, don't look at others' faults. Look at your own faults. Learn to see the world as your own. Learn to see the world as your own. Focus on every word. Every word is significant here from a philosophical standpoint. Then she says finally, Nobody's a stranger actually. In reality, if you see things the right way, nobody's a stranger. The world is yours is literally what she's saying. You might think, though, well, okay, so she's more, it's a wonderful teaching, but she's just repeating what Jesus taught. Uh, don't find fault in others. Why look at the splinter in another person's eye rather than the giant wooden beam in your own eye? Look at your own faults. It's true, she's saying it, but she's adding something very profound. She's giving the metaphysical basis for not fi finding fault in others. She's giving an Advaitic metaphysical basis. She's saying that the reason why you shouldn't find fault in others is because they're not different from you. There's nothing other than God. You're a manifestation of God, and every single person you see around you is also equally a manifestation of God. So it's completely illogical for you to find fault in others because uh, uh, there's only God, right? So logically, you should love everybody. This is the Vigyana metaphysical basis of her teaching about not finding fault in others. But there's something even deeper here. This teaching is not just about finding fault in others. I see this, this is my own interpretation, and you can feel free to have your own. I see this as the equivalent of Sri Ramakrishna's ethical teaching, Shib Gana Jiba Shiva. Serve others in a spirit of worship by seeing God in everyone. This is one of his famous teachings that's recorded in the Leela Prashanga, in Sharanana's biography of Sri Ramakrishna. I see her teaching as the equivalent of that. How do I see this? Another teaching of hers really helps us to see this broader and deeper philosophical dimension to her teaching. This is also quoted in Pragyananandaji's article, Gyanodayini. I had never come across this, and I was very excited when I found this, because she very rarely talks about her own spiritual realizations. This is one of those rare occasions when she's speaking about her own Vigyana realization. So let me read it in Bangla again first, and then I'll roughly translate it. Akbar dekhi ki tajano. Do you know what I, what I realized one day, what I saw in a spiritual realization one day? Dekina, Thakur Shab Hoyroichan. I saw that Sri Ramakrishna has become everything. Je dike dekhi, she dike Thakur. In whichever direction I turned, I saw nothing but Sri Ramakrishna. Tokon Bujlum. Oh, sorry. Kanao Thakur, Khonao Thakur. Thakur chara arkyo ne. The blind person, the blind people I see who are in intense suffering and pain, they are, I saw them as Sri Ramakrishna. Kura Takud, crippled people, lame people who can't walk properly. I saw Sri Ramakrishna in them also. Not just in them, but they were Sri Ramakrishna. Taku chara arkyo ne. There's nothing but Sri Ramakrishna in this entire world. That was my, that's, that was my realization. Jeeb kono koshto pachena tini pachin. It's a mistake to think that different people are suffering in this world. It's not, that's not true. What's the truth? Sri Ramakrishna is suffering in all these different forms, in the form of all the different people we're seeing suffering around us. Sri Ramakrishna himself is suffering in all these forms, in the, in the form of the lame and the blind and the poor and the, and the weeping. Here you get the ethical teaching. That's why, she says, whoever comes weeping and falling at my feet, I have to rescue them. Uddhar kori. Now she's assuming the form of Divine Mother. Some, she's very shy about it. But whoever takes refuge at my, at my feet, I must res rescue them. Because I see nothing but Sri Ramakrishna. And those weeping people who are coming full of worldly pains and sorrows, they also are Sri Ramakrishna. How can I not serve them? How can I not rescue them? Tari jinishe tankei kori. 
I'm serving none other than Sri Ramakrishna himself by serving the people I see around me and the people who come to me. What a wonderful teaching. And again, this teaching, if we, if we pair it with this teaching about what seems to be just about fault finding, we get a much deeper philosophical core to the teaching. Since everything and everyone is God, none other than God herself, the Divine Mother herself, it's not just about not finding fault in others. We should positively serve and worship every single human being, every single soul, not just human being. Animals, we talk about the environmental crisis and about every single living being we should serve lovingly in a spirit of worship. And this is why I just think, again, when we think about her life, you know, of course, this was her own spiritual realization of Vigyana, but other incidents. Brahmanandaji was very smart because he was a spiritual son of Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother, so he's very smart. Anytime somebody would come to him for diksha, and he could read into people's karma and see what, what they were in the past. He said, oh my goodness, this is too much for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have, you know, who knows what kind of illnesses I'm going to get if I give this person initiation. Send him to Holy Mother. <laughs> this is his standard r method. So he initiated very few people comparatively. Holy Mother was like a vast ocean. Anybody who came to her, she said, that's why she said, anybody who comes weeping to me, I, I must rescue them. I must give mantra. She was much less discriminating, much, much less discriminating than even Sri Ramakrishna himself about whom she would accept as disciples. That was her, her boundless love. And Premanandaji said in that context, in the context of somebody saying, Brahmanandaji, he's very you know, stingy about whom he gives initiation to. Premananda goes in this very high state of ecstasy and he says, Kripa, Kripa. That's Holy Mother's mercy, her boundless mercy. If we gave diksha to these people, we would, we would have been burnt into ashes. If we gave diksha to these people, we would have been burnt into ashes. Look at her spiritual stature. And we should remember. So I see this teaching, which seems to be just about fault finding, as this much deeper teaching, which is much closer to Sri Ramakrishna's teaching, Shib Gyana Jiva Sheva. Serve others in a spirit of worship and love by seeing God in everyone. Swami Vivekananda said the same thing in a very beautiful way, in a very powerful letter he wrote on 9th July 1897. Many of you are familiar with this, but I'll just read it. May I be born again and again and suffer thousands of miseries so that I may worship the only God that exists, the only God I believe in, the sum total of all souls, and above all, my God the wicked, my God the, wisdom, the miserable, my God the poor of all races, of all species, is the special object of my worship. And he gave these four lectures on practical Vedanta where he said exactly the same thing. That when you s actually see everybody as God, you can't help but lovingly serve them in a spirit of worship. That's exactly what Holy Mother is saying, I think. Um, another thing that you find in her daily life is that she was the ideal embodiment of the synthesis of the four yogas. She beautifully harmonized all four of the yogas in her daily life in a way that is almost unparalleled. So she seemed like a simple housewife engaged in all sorts of household chores, karma yoga, cutting vegetables, making food, chapatis, and this and that, and talking and taking care of her niece, Radhu, who was very, very difficult to deal with, and Radhu's mother was even more of a nightmare. So all those things, karma yoga, but doing it with complete equanimity, detachment, and love. Jnana yoga, she would also sometimes go into the state of Nivikapa Samadhi. Not for long, but there's a reason, because if she was in that state for long, she wouldn't be able to serve. That's her love again. It's because of that love that she had for everybody that she, she wouldn't stay in that state for very long. Just as Sri Ramakrishna also wouldn't. Bhakti yoga. We don't even have to give examples. Her whole life was bhakti yoga. Her whole prana, her whole life breath was devoted to Sri Ramakrishna. Every waking moment was, uh, was filled with thoughts of God. Raja yoga, which is basically the yoga of concentration, meditation. She once made a tremendous statement. I do 100,000 japa every day. And some of our monks, senior monks once told me, he said, I, I calculated that and I tried to figure out how much japa I'd have to do per hour in order to, how many hours of japa I'd have to do to, to reach 100,000. It's, 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 it's crazy how much you have to do. So how she managed to do that, why, in the midst of all of her, you know, she's working for what, 18, 20 hours a day, is absolutely unbelievable. I think the only way one can do that is if it's ajapa japa. That's a term which means this is japa that's not done consciously, but it's, 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 it's gone so deep into the psyche and into the unconscious that it bubbles up from within. So she doesn't even have to intentionally take the name of God as we do, right, as spiritual aspirants. 
And in this context, I think it's useful to mention something that Premanandaji said about Holy Mother. He said, in one respect, one could even argue that Holy Mother was greater than Sri Ramakrishna. In what respect? Sri Ramakrishna, we saw him day to day, on a day to day basis. He would often just f soar into these very high transcendental states of, of ecstasy, of samadhi, when he would lose all external consciousness. He broke his arm once, that's recorded in the gospel, because he went into one of these states and nobody was there to support his arm. And he fell and he broke his arm. So he always needed attendants to look after him. Holy Mother? No. She was looking after other people. So she had this tremendous power of self-control and self-restraint. She would prevent her mind from soaring into the transcendental plane in order to serve others. Now, I come to uh, the philosophically uh, interesting part of my uh, lecture, what are some of the standard objections that some of you might level against me and say, but, 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 what about this, what about that? So let me mention three objections and try to respond to them. And I'm sure you have more, but at least I'll hope to have addressed some of them. One, the first one that may come to your mind. Okay, you just made this case, this tenuous case that Holy Mother was a uh, Vigyana Vedanta and just like Sri Ramakrishna. But didn't she also say Thakur was Advaita? This is something I hear from a lot of monks, from other devotees. So let me address this. Let's address it head on. Let me give you the context here. 1901. Swami Vimalanandaji and Swami Virajanandaji, disciple of Swami Vikananda, they were in Mayavati Advaita Ashrama, this really beautiful Himalayan ashrama, which Swami Vikananda himself you know, had the whole plan for. And they installed a shrine for Sri Ramakrishna in that Mayavati Ashrama. And they thought, well, this is, of course, perfect. Who is going to object to a shrine for Sri Ramakrishna in one of our own Ramakrishna Mission Ashramas? None other than Swami Vivekananda objected. It was 1901. He was still living. One year before he passed away, he left his body. He was very displeased. And Vimalananji was crestfallen. And he wrote to Holy Mother about it. She's always the last refuge, even for monks. So Holy Mother says this in response to Vimalananji, pouting like a child. Amader guru jini tini to addoito tumra jokhon shei guru chishyo tokhon tumra addoito badi ami jor korie koriya bolite pari tumra obosho addoito badi Shuram Krishna Thakur was advaita advaita it doesn't say advaitan but advaita that's significant too first of all notice the exact language in bengali thakur was advaita and since you're disciples of him you also are Advaita Vadis. That's the Bengali. Advaita Vadi. Advaita Vadis. You are also followers of Advaita. That's what she says. I firmly say this to you. You might say, well, then this supports the view that, uh, she, that uh, she understood that Sri Ramakrishna was a follower of classical Advaita Vedanta and that all followers of Sri Ramakrishna are also followers of classical Advaita. I think this is a seriously mistaken, if prevalent, interpretation of this teaching. Why? Let me appeal to a much greater authority than myself, Swami Bhuteshanandaji, one of the great realized souls of our order and a former president of the Ramakrishna Madan Mission. He, uh, there are some wonderful volumes of dialogues, in, originally in Bengali, called Puri Prashno. And so I'm quoting from, I think, the first volume. Somebody, one, a monk, says, Maharaj, you're saying that Sri Ramakrishna was not just a classical Advaitin, but he embraced all the different philosophies. But didn't Holy Mother say Thakur was Advaita? This objection that I'm talking about now. What is Bhutesh Anandaji's response? Let me read it in Bangla first, then I'll translate it roughly. Bhutesh Anandaji says, Ma ekotha bishesh jan ke ekti bishesh ghatanar poriprekkite boli chilen. She said this teaching, that Thakur was Advaita and you are followers of Advaita, in a very specific context which I already mentioned to you, actually, about the Himalayan Mayavati Advaita Ashrama, right? Now, let's keep going. E kothadara thakuret doshon ba thakuret bhav ke shimito kora jabena. You cannot limit Holy Mother's and Sri Ramakrishna's bhava, spiritual attitude and spiritual philosophy, just to one teaching, given in a particular context. Then he, he elaborates this. Thakur ki shudhui advaiti chilen. Was Sri Ramakrishna just uh, an Advaitan? Doiti Chilena, was he not a dualist? Ma Oddota Ashme Puja Bondo Kote Bolitin. Holy Mother said you should stop doing the puja, the worship of Sri Ramakrishna in Mayavati. This is what he says. But then he says, Koi Bolanito, Udbodan Takur Kor Tulidite. It's very funny in Bangla. If you know Bangla, she's say, uh, is saying it in a very funny way. She didn't say that you should stop worshiping Sri Ramakrishna in Udbodan. Udbodan is where she lived, Bhagbajan, uh, the place in Kolkata where she lived. 
Did, did, she, did, did, did she also say that you should stop worshiping Sri Ramakrishna in other ashramas throughout India? No, she said specifically in that one ashrama, you should stop doing worship of Sri Ramakrishna. Then he continues. Chocolate hashi. So because he said it in this very funny way in his charming Bengali, everybody's laughing. Then Bhuteshanji continues. Thakur bolechen ishwarer iti kora jayena taar ananto bhav ananto lab. Sri Ramakrishna used to teach and now he's bringing in other teachings which you also have to take into account. You can never put a limit to God. This is something you find in the gospel again and again. God has infinitely many attitudes, forms, aspects. And so therefore, different people, different sages, different mystics can realize the same God in so many different forms and aspects. Ami Shabni, he's quoting more of Bhuteshans, he's quoting more of Sri Ramakrishna's teachings, which he's saying are absolutely essential to getting a more comprehensive understanding of Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy. Jajamon Bhab Tartemon Lab means in exactly the way that we like to think of God, in precisely that way God favors us. Is in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, just as you approach me, I will then show myself, manifest myself to you. In that spirit, Sri Ramakrishna says exactly the same thing. And then he quotes this, another teaching of Sri Ramakrishna, Ami Shabni, I accept everything. And actually, I hope I have time to do this, but there, I'm going to quote the context of this beautiful statement of Sri Ramakrishna. I, however, accept everything. Which means not just the impersonal, but also I accept Vishta Dvaita, I accept Dvaita, I accept Advaita Vedanta, I accept absolutely everything, all the different forms and aspects of God. Ta and then Bhuteshanji concludes, Thakurid e kothagula monerakbe. You have to take into account comprehensively all of Sri Ramakrishna's teachings about God and never limit uh, Holy Mother or Sri Ramakrishna or Swami Vivekananda just to one teaching taken out of context. Never do that. That's a serious mistake. Then he says, If we only take one teaching out of context and take that to be the whole teaching, we won't grasp the fundamental spiritual and philosophical core of what they're saying. Okay, so I think this is a very, very important statement, and I want all of you to kind of think about this, reflect on it on your own. But on this basis, I want to um, reflect a little bit. So, what is Bhuteshanji saying? First of all, remember, he's saying the context of that statement is absolutely crucial. In one specific Advaita ashrama, which is earmarked to be an ashrama designed by Swami Vivekananda for meditation on non dual pure consciousness, the worship of Sri Ramakrishna or any other deity for that matter should, is forbidden. That's the context. But we have hundreds of ashramas throughout the world and we worship Sri Ramakrishna in almost all of them. Certainly in all of them in India. In the West, it's a little bit more complicated because the audience is different. But in many of the places we also, I'm in Hollywood and we do uh, daily puja of Sri Ramakrishna. Nobody ever said that we should stop. Holy Mother certainly didn't say we should stop worshiping Sri Ramakrishna in those places. What does she mean by that? I think what she's saying then, so building on Bhuteshamji's response, I would make two further points, okay? First thing is, what exactly does Holy Mother mean when she says that Sri Ramakrishna was Advaita? Advaita. What does she mean by Advaita in that context? I think a really helpful clue to what she means by Advaita is given by Swami Turiyanandaji, another great chief disciple, uh, another great dis monastic disciple of Sri, of Sri Ramakrishna. In a 1919 letter written originally in Bengali, he refers to one of Sri Ramakrishna's famous teachings, which many people also take out of context, by the way. Tie the knowledge of Advaita in your loincloth and do whatever you please. And so some people see this as proving that Sri Ramakrishna was a classical Advaita. Advaita gyan achole bede jai iche koro. And Turiyanji interprets it from the standpoint of Vigyana in this letter. He says, what this means is, the ultimate truth is the one Advaita, he uses the exact same word, which has been called Brahman, Paramatma, Bhagavan, and so on. This is Turiyanji's explanation of what, Advaita, what Sri Ramakrishna means by Advaita. This Advaita is not just non-dual pure consciousness, which he refers to as Brahman, but it's equally Paramatma, the Supreme Self, sought after by yogis in meditation, and Bhagavan, the personal God, Shakti. So this Advaita is not the narrow Advaita, which is just Nirguna Brahman of classical Advaita. This is Nirguna Saguna. It's Brahman and Shakti. In this sense, Advaita, Holy Mother is saying, Thakur is Advaita in this sense. He is the one divine reality, which in one aspect is Nirguna, and in another aspect is Saguna. Now, why is this such a profound idea? 
now we can get to a deeper understanding of what she's saying. She's saying, stop worshipping Sri Ramakrishna in the image in, in Mayavati Advaita Ashrama. Do you think that means that you're no longer worshipping Sri Ramakrishna? How foolish of you. Sri Ramakrishna was not only Nirguna, he was not only Saguna, he was also Nirguna. He is non-dual pure consciousness just as much as he's Shakti. So when you're stopping worship of Sri Ramakrishna in the personal form, as the form of an incarnation in this image, and you say, I'm going to shut my eyes and say, Soham, Aham Brahmasmi, I am that non-dual pure consciousness. You're still meditating on Sri Ramakrishna. You can't get away from, from Sri Ramakrishna, even in Mayavati, even in the highest altitudes of the Himalayas. The same Sri Ramakrishna is there, just in his Nidguna aspect. I think that's the deeper point she's making. Second objection that, that some people may raise against my Vigyana Vedanta interpretation of Holy Mother's teachings, she also said the following in Bangla first. Kale ishotishu kichu thakena. Gyan hole manus dekhe thakur tukur shabi maya. Kale asche jache. Holy Mother said, eventually you'll find in a particular stage of spiritual realization that Ishwar, even Ishwara disappears. The, personal, the form of the personal God disappears. Gyan hole manus dekhe thakur tukur shabi maya. After you attain jnana, the word jnana is important here. Maybe some of you will see where I'm going with this. But anyway, gyan hole manus deke thakur tukur shabi maya. Kale asche jache. When you attain the state of jnana, this realization of jnana, you see that thakur tukur, it's almost like a kind of pejorative term. All these forms of the personal God, they, they, you see them all as maya. They come and they go. Now, Again, just as Bhuteshanandi said, you have to take things in context, you have to be comprehensive. Same thing goes for this teaching. What's the context? Now let me read you the broader context. She's saying, Noren bole chilo. She's saying, Swami Vekananda himself said the following. Ma, amar ajkal shab ure jache. Shabhi dekchi ure jai. Noren is saying, the future Swami Vekananda, or no, he became Vivekananda by that time. He said, I'm seeing now in my current spiritual state that everything is vanishing. All these forms of the personal God, that seems to be implied. All these things are vanishing. Then Holy Mother replies, Ami bollum, dekho, dekho, ama ke uriye diyona. She says in a very funny way. She says, just make sure that you don't uh, make me disappear. <laughs> just as these forms of the personal God. Noren bolle, ma, tuma ke uriye dile thaki ko thai. Ma, no, that's, God forbid. If I, if I get rid of you, then what's left? Where will I stand? Je gane guru padapaddu uriye de, she to og gyan, guru padapaddu uriye dile gyan darai ko thai. If we dismiss the lotus feet of our guru, where will we stand? There will be nothing left. Then, Holy Mother says this statement that I had just read, out of context. Now I'm giving you the context. Gyan hole isho tisho shab ure jai. Ma, ma, sheshe dekhe. Ma, ma, jagod jure. Shab ek hoi danai. Eito shoja kothata. This is very, very important. She says, when you attain the state of gyana, isho tisho shab ure jai. Ishwara, the, all the forms of the personal God, they disappear, they vanish. Then, she continues, Sheshe dekhe, but finally one sees what? Ma amar jagat jure. Ma amar jagat jure. One sees that, that the Divine Mother has become everything in this world. After jnana comes vigyana. Shab ak hoi darai e to shoja kothata. She's being very emphatic and saying this is the simple highest truth. Shab ak hoi darai. You see everything is God. You see only oneness. What is the oneness? The Divine. After jnana, there's an even further state of spiritual realization where you see nothing but Divine Mother in everything. Exactly like Sri Ramakrishna said, after jnana comes vigyana. After seeing, dismissing this world as a dream in the state of jnana, in the state of nirvikava samadhi, you come back and you see the same world as a real manifestation of shakti, as a vigyani. And who uh, realized this? Swami Pragyanandaji, in that same wonderful article that I keep plugging, please do read it if, you're, if you can read Bengali. He, he, he notes this point. He says that this tallies exactly with Sri Ramakrishna's teachings on the two stages of jnana and vigyana. He even beautifully links Holy Mother's teaching here to two different incidents in our tradition. Number one, famous incident, Naren, the young Naren goes to Sri Ramakrishna and says, I just want to immerse myself in the state of Nirvikapa Samadhi. Maybe I'll come down once in a while just to have a little milk so, I, so that the body is preserved. And Sri Ramakrishna severely scolds him, reprimands him. It's a shame on you. I thought you would be like a great banyan tree, giving shade to thousands. Now I see you're selfish. You only care about your own salvation. And he says, aren't you the one who sings? Oh Lord, you are all that exists. Thou art all that exists. It's one of his favorite songs. Aren't you, aren't you the one who sings about Vigyana, that there's nothing but God? Why would you dismiss this world as unreal? 
serve God in a spirit of worship by serving these, the people that you see around you. It was Sri Ramakrishna who turned Swami Vivekananda into a Vigyani, who said, you're, you are far greater than you realize. You're not meant for just jnana. You're a Vigyani. You're, you've come here not because of your own karma, but to help others, to help suffering humanity by seeing God in everyone. And he also, Pragyananda, he links it to Turiyanji's teaching, his famous final words, Brahma Shottu Jagat Shottu. Shabi Shutto. Brahman is true and so is this world. Jagat is also Satya. Opposite. It's the reversal of Shankara's classical Advaita. So Holy Mother is saying exactly the same thing. Pragyanaji notices this. So I, I think it's a very, uh, very profound insight that he has here. Third objection that people might raise. She also says in one place that this world is a dream. Again, the context is important. Arupananaji is the one who asks this question. So what is a... St- st- there seems to be a difference between the waking state and the dream state, isn't there? And then Holy Mother says in that context, and because I'm running out of time and I want to cover a little more ground, so I'm just going to summarize. But she says, Shopno boy archichunoi. This world is nothing but a dream. Just, just like you saw this dream at night and now it's not there, just so the waking state is, is, is just as much a dream when you realize Brahman, when you realize the highest truth. That's true, she said this. But again, you always have to keep in mind the context. Arupanandaji, she noticed, had Advaitic leaning, so she taught him that. And she gives the example that Sri Ramakrishna also used of a farmer who falls asleep, has a dream that he's a king, a very wealthy king with eight sons. One after another, these sons die. Or, no, they don't die, sorry. In the dream, they're alive. He wakes up from the dream, and his wife comes to him and says, you heartless idiot, you're not, our son has died and you're, you're not weeping? And he says, should I weep for the one son that, that has died in the waking state or the eight sons that I lost in my dream? This is a teaching recorded in the gospel. Holy Mother's quoting the same teaching. Now, the interesting thing is, Sri Ramakrishna uses, gives that teaching in a very specific context to Mohimachoram, that same Mohimachakaburti who is that staunch follower of Shankara. Okay? Sri Ramakrishna, this is on October 26th, 1884, recorded in the Gospel. Sri Ramakrishna says, in the light, because he knew that he was an Advaitan, he said, in the light of Advaita Vedantic reasoning, the world is illusory, unreal as a dream. These things are in your line of thought. The waking state is only as real as a dream. Let me tell you a story that agrees with your attitude. And then he goes on to tell the farmer story, the same story that Holy Mother is quoting. Then at the end of that he says, but for my part, Sri Ramakrishna then contrasts his own view with the view he just elaborated, which is the view of classical Advaita. But for my part, I accept everything. Remember Bhuteshanji quoting the same teaching? Ami Shabloi, I accept everything. Turiyana, Turiya, and also the three states of waking dream and deep sleep. I accept all three states. I accept all, Brahman and also Maya, the universe and its living beings. If I accepted less, I should not get the full weight. Sri Ramakrishna explicitly contrasts his own Vigyana Vedanta philosophy, Brahma Satyam Jagat Satyam, with Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya, and saying, I'm teaching this to you because that's, that's what you like. Holy Mother's doing the same thing. But her ultimate view, she says, Mama Jagat Jude, nothing but Divine Mother and everything in this world. That's the final realization. Now, uh, because it's already been uh, an hour and 10 minutes, I'm a little embarrassed, but so I, I, there are two options here. One is I can touch on some of what I see as her, her most original philosophical contributions briefly and then open it up to questions, or if you guys have had enough of me, we can go straight to questions. What should we do? First one? All right, so good. Most of you are not falling asleep yet. Okay, let me try to cover three what I see as really original philosophical insights of Holy Mothers. First, one of the big philosophical questions is, this is raised in all of the traditional schools uh, of Indian philosophy. How do we reconcile the law of karma with the grace of God? This might come up in our day-to-day spiritual lives also. We, uh, Sri Ramakrishna is always talking about God's grace, God's grace, but at the same time we are told to accept the law of karma. What we reap, we sow. How do we reconcile these two things? Let me begin with something Sri Ramakrishna said. First, Nanda a visitor of Sri Ramakrishna. This is recorded in the Gospel. He says, he raises this issue. He says, but how can we obtain God's grace? Has she really the power to bestow grace? This is Nanda's objection or question. Sri Ramakrishna, smiling. I see, you think as the intellectuals do. One reaps the results of one's actions. Give up these ideas. The effect of karma wears away if one takes refuge in God. Nanda, can God violate law? What do you mean? She is the Lord. Notice I'm, I'm silently uh, 
retranslating Nikolai and Azizi's translate. He always translates God as he. I always translate God as she. She is the Lord. She can do everything. She who has made the law can also change it. God created the law of karma. Why can't he change the law of karma? So this is Sri Ramakrishna's point. Now, Holy Mother echoes his teaching, but, but adds a nuance, which I think is really important. Holy Mother says, So, Okay, so when you take refuge in God, God will take care of your karma. He will not completely wipe it out, but mitigate your karma. He'll wipe out your karma, she'll wipe out karma with her own pen. It's a metaphor, obviously. But she adds something which even Sri Ramakrishna, as far as I'm aware, at least it wasn't recorded. And even Swami Vivekananda, I couldn't find it anywhere in the complete works. She adds the following. She says, what she's saying here is, she's adding a nuance. God, even God doesn't completely erase our proud of the karma. Just because we take refuge in God doesn't mean that all of our past karma is erased completely. We have to experience the effects of the technical. She's using the technical philosophical term, prarabdha karma. Prarabdha karma means the karma that's due to us in this particular life as a result of what we ourselves did in our previous lives and earlier in this life. She says, prarabdha bhog bhukte hai. We have to experience the results of the, our prarabdha karma. Tobe bhogomar ad nam kodle e hai, jamon ek jonet pa kite jabar kota chilo, shekane ekta kanta fute bhogolo. But if as a result of our proud of the karma, we were, our whole leg was supposed to be chopped off, <laughs> like something really, really bad was supposed to happen, instead, we'll feel it like a pinprick. What she's saying is, God won't completely eliminate the effects of your karma, but she can significantly mitigate the effects of your karma. So that's an important nuance that really helps us to reconcile God's grace with karma. You, the law of karma still holds, 100%. But the effects can be mitigated through spiritual practice, by God's grace. Okay? Second question. This is a kind of perennial question. It's one of the huge objections lob, uh, lob, lobbed against uh, Hinduism by Christian missionaries when they came to India. and You still find discussions of this. Idol worship, so-called idol worship. I don't like that term. Image worship is better. So is God really present in divine images and pictures? This is the question. And specifically, since we're in, we're, many of us are followers of the Ramakrishna tradition, this picture we have in front of us, which is worshipped, is Sri Ramakrishna actually present in this picture? This is the question. Swami Arupananda ji, he asks this question to Holy Mother. Is Sri Ramakrishna really present in the picture, in the image? And she says the following, Achenna chaya kaya shaman, chobito ta chaya. Okay, the teaching goes on, but let me just focus on that first. This is, first of all, she's doing something that Sri Ramakrishna was very fond of, rhyming, which is completely missed in the English translation, unfortunately. Chaya kaya. These are Bengali words. Chaya means shadow. Kaya means body, physical body. Chaya kaya shaman. They're one and the same. Or inseparable might be, in this context, maybe a better translation. Chobito tan chaya. The divine image is nothing but the shadow of Sri Ramakrishna himself. Now, this metaphor of shadow is really interesting. It's very striking, and I think it's original. And I think there's a kind of deeper philosophical idea here. It's obviously a metaphor. Now, there are different ways of kind of cashing out this metaphor. One, one, one way of cashing out will be, well, a metaphor is less real than the body that's being reflected. But I don't think that's the sense in which he means it. Chaya kaya shaman means that this image actually, it's not just a representation of God, it is God. The image itself is God. Why? How do we know this? It's also based on this Vigyana Vedanta metaphysics. Because there's nothing but God. So if Ma Jogal Jude, if, if Divine Mother has become everything, does she, is the only thing she's not present in the Divine Image? Are you crazy? She's also present in the Divine Image. Now, she also adds a further point, which is really interesting. She says, Dakte dakte chobite tar abhirbhav hoi, sthanti ekti peet hoi. As you call on God in that image, God will finally actually Avirbhava is a very loaded word, philosophically and spiritually. It almost means incarnation. God will actually come into that divine image. It's already, God is already there to a lower degree. But as you worship, if great souls and with sincere spiritual practitioners come to a place and worship that image, God will manifest to an even greater de degree in that image. 
So this is an, another nuance which he adds, which I think is really, really, really useful. If any of you are familiar with Ramanuja's philosophy, he has a beautiful idea called the Archavatara. What he means by that is, God incarnate in the form of divine images. God doesn't just incarnate in the form of human beings, Rama, Krishna, Jesus, Shram, Krishna. God incarnates in the form of divine images, which are worshipped with due reverence and love. So I think Holy Mother is saying something very similar here. And finally, this is actually a big can of worms. Maybe I'll just like open the can of worms and then shut it again because it's kind of a big issue. It's the so-called problem of evil. God is supposed to be all-loving. He's supposed to love us. God is also, by definition, omnipotent, all-powerful, which means if he wanted to, he could prevent the suffering that we see around us. And yet every single one of us has experienced suffering. Why? Why does an all-loving and omnipotent God uh, uh, permit so much suffering in this world? This is called the problem of evil. This is a massive problem in theology and philosophy of religion across the world's religious traditions. Not as much of, a, of an issue in Indian philosophies, interestingly. We'll see why in a second. Holy Mother says, in response to this uh, problem of evil raised by Swami Arupanandaji, she says, Shishti shuk dukkha moi, dukkha na thakle shuk ki boja jai. So, this whole creation, this whole world is nothing but a combination of sukha and dukkha, happiness and sorrow. You cannot have one without the other. And she said, Can you even understand happiness and experience happiness in a true way without encountering sorrow? Is that even possible? And, And, and is it possible for everybody to be happy at exactly the same time? This is a very interesting point she's making. And then she gives us a really interesting story, which I don't have time to read, about Sita and Rama. She says, Sita turns to Rama, her beloved husband, and who's God incarnate. And she says, hey, all, there are all these, all, so many of your subjects are suffering, they're, they're poor, they're in pain. If you want it, I know you can make everybody happy. Why don't you do so? Rama says, since, since you're asking, I'll, I'll do it for you. Let me do it. Um, just like that, by fiat, he, he made everybody happy in his kingdom. What happened? Whatever people wanted, they would go to the kingdom, request whatever they wanted. He's like a wish-fulfilling tree, gives them whatever they want. It's a kind of infinite uh, storehouse of, 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 of goodies. Everybody's happy, nobody works anymore. Because it's all like, like everybody's in retirement now because they don't need to do anything. <laughs> now what happens? Suddenly Sita notices, she looks at the corner of her roof and she says, wait a minute, now there's a leak here, we need to call a plumber. And then, oh, this, is, this, this thing needs, a, the, the table needs repairing. We need to call a carpenter. And she tells Rama. Rama says, all right, let me look into it. Oh, no more carpenters in the land of Ayodhya. No more plumbers in the land of Ayodhya. And not just Sita's palace, but all, one by one, these houses start getting dilapidated and people are starting to suffer <laughs> because they're, they're feeling cold, because water's leaking. And then Ram says, Sita says, okay, 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 go back, make things the way they were before. <laughs> And Ram says, see, I told you so. <laughs> so anyway, so now, what is the philosophical significance of all these things? What Holy Mother, oh, and by the way, and then the moral of this Sita Rama story, she says, Chirodin keo shuki takbena, shob jonmo karu dukhe jabena, jamon kormo temon fall, temon joga joghai. Nobody will be happy forever. And in all births, nobody will remain in sorrow. In all births, notice she's bringing in this doctrine of karma and rebirth. Jamon kormo, tamon fall, tamon joga joghai. Just as one reaps, one sows. And exactly in that, in accordance with your karma, do you undergo experiences in this life? Okay. Now, what are the different aspects of a response to the problem of evil? I think number one, this last sentence. Jamon kormo, tamon fall, tamon joga joghai. She's bringing the doctrine of karma. I just mentioned to you, why is it that in Indian philosophy, the problem of evil is such a minor issue? It's almost never raised. It is raised once in a while, but very rarely, in the Brahma Sutra and some commentaries. But it's not such a big deal. Because of this, the twin doctrines of karma and rebirth. And there's a Western scholar named Arthur Herman who wrote a book called The, uh, the Problem of Evil in Indian Thought, where he says, he surveys all of the world's major theodicies. The theodicy means different responses to the problem of evil from the standpoint of different religious traditions, Christian, Muslim, Jewish. He focused on the Abrahamic religions. Went through them one by one, pointed out massive philosophical problems in all of them, and then says... Let's turn to the Indian view. Karma and rebirth. It's the only satisfying solution in the problem of evil. Without accepting karma and rebirth, we cannot satisfactorily explain the problem of evil. And Holy Mother, that's why her go-to response, the first thing is, the first line response is, 
the law of karma, one of the things that's powerful about the, the, the combination of these two is that imagine the suffering of, of a two-year-old. What did the two-year-old do to deserve cerebral meningitis and then passing away? At the, you cannot possibly explain this without bringing the law of karma and rebirth. Second point she makes in response to the problem of evil. Shristi shuk dukkhomoy, dukkho na thakle shuk ki boja jai. Can you even experience true happiness without also encountering sorrow in, in life? I think this is very profound and it's a subtle point that she's making. To help us kind of unpack the subtlety, let's go back to Sri Ramakrishna briefly. Sri Ramakrishna asks, well, some, he's often asked the same question in the gospel, it's recorded in many places. And he says, yes, why has God created evil qualities in us like lust and greed? He says, Mohot lok toyed korbin bole, in order to create saints. It's such an interesting answer. In order to create saints. Saints, mohot lok. In order to create great souls. That's why he created lust and greed. You're like, well, what's the connection between? The idea is, it's only through encountering evil and unwholesome qualities in ourselves and in other people that we can grow morally and spiritually, that we can evolve and come closer and closer to God. This is just a fact of human nature. Swami Vivekananda used to say, suffering is the great eye-opener. Every single one of you, I guarantee you, you've learned more from your suffering than from your, from your happy moments. In our happiness, we forget God, typically. In our suffering, we call on God. Uh, just to give you one example, I'll give you a concrete example if you want an example. <clears throat> I'm not a parent, but I can imagine, and I've heard stories from others. So there's a young parent. <clears throat> She's got a five-year-old son. She goes to a friend's house who is also a parent of a five-year-old son. And she goes and she notices that mother is being really nasty. The son did something very minor. And the mother is really railing into him and even slaps him on the face. And the kid reacts very badly and starts weeping and doesn't talk to her for days. What happened? This mother, by seeing that, by seeing that evil action inflicted by that mother, she says, my goodness, this is something I need to avoid. I better not be like that. You learn from other people's, but you can also learn from your own. Uh, your own evil qualities in yourself. How? For instance, I make some mistake. And a good friend of mine, not just a random person, but a good friend of mine points out that mistake to me. I lose my temper. And I start shouting at him, say, you're an idiot, and uh, what do you know anyway? And I say, well, you, you, you've done worse things than me. As this is human nature, this is ego, right? What happens? The friend doesn't talk to me for a few days. I start reflecting and thinking, wait a minute, I shouldn't have said that. And you know what? Now that I think about it, that was my mistake. <laughs> and he was right, and he didn't even say it in a bad way. He said it in a nice way. Why did I react in that way? I need to control my anger better. This, is, I think, is, these are concrete examples that might help us understand. What does Ramakrishna mean when he says, God has created evil qualities in all of us, in order to create saints. Ultimately, he says, every single soul will attain salvation in the end. We, every single one of us will realize God. Everyone will be fed, he says. Some, some people at 6 in the morning, others at 12 p.m., others at 6 p.m., some people at midnight. That's rebirth again, karma and rebirth. Some people in this life will realize God. Others, maybe a thousand lives or not. Others, maybe a million lives. Hitler's probably been set back quite a bit. But even he will attain salvation eventually. And finally, I wanted to add one more nuance, which is she also in another place, the ultimate response to the problem of evil is given by Sri Ramakrishna and she repeats it. Turianji, the future Turianji, his name was Hari. He says, you're talking about every, this world as God's play, as mother's play, but her play is our death. It's a very poetic and poignant statement. Her play is our death. We suffer. You're calling it play, but we're suffering. That is, her play is our suffering. Isn't that cruel? What does he say? The first response, Sri Ramakrishna says, but who are you? Tini, uh, God has become everything and everyone. But who are you? God has become everything and everyone in this world. What, what does he mean by this? What he means is, the problem of evil itself arises because we assume that there's a distinction between God on the one hand, who is omnipotent and all loving and could prevent our suffering if he wanted to, and us, poor suffering creatures on the other hand. And we say, God, why don't you, why didn't, why don't you remove this suffering and why, you could have prevented it, why didn't you if you love me? He's saying that very premise is wrong at its very foundation because the, that suffering creature himself or herself is also God. You yourself are God. That, that suffering creature is also God. That's why Holy Mother said, those suffering people, the weeping people who come to me, I see nothing but Sri Ramakrishna in them. So that's the ultimate response to the problem of evil. That's not even a solution to the problem of evil. That's a dissolution of the problem of evil. It dissolves the problem of evil because it, it just removes, it undercuts the premise. 
which is that there's a distinction between God and, his suffering, and her suffering creatures, on the other hand. And in Sri Ramakrishna's own life, there's a beautiful incident when he sees a butterfly with a kind of splinter in its wing. This is recorded in the Leela Prashanga, the biography of Sri Ramakrishna. And it's, it seems like it's on its way to dying. And he felt terrible, just tremendous compassion for this butterfly. And he just thinks about how this five-year-old boy might have inflicted that pain on this butterfly by cruelly sticking the splinter in the butterfly's wing without knowing that, you know, just because it got a kick out of, you know, some kids are like that, kind of uh, sadistic. In the next moment, Sri Ramakrishna goes in a very high state of vigyana, basically. And then he says, but then I realized that God has become the butterfly. God has also become the boy inflicting the suffering on the butterfly. And then he said, whom can I blame? I see nothing but God. So the ultimate solution to the problem of evil is not philosophical, but spiritual. You have to attain the state of realization that everything is God. But for the, for the rest of us, people who, uh, who are not Vigyanis, like all of us here, or maybe some of you are, that would be wonderful. There's the law of karma. There's the doctrine of universal salvation and rebirth um, to kind of answer our sort of rational, skeptical questions that might come up in our day-to-day -day spiritual lives. Thank you so much. Now I'd love to hear from you. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu Thanks for your patience. People often complain that I speak too quickly. So I was started by trying to speak slow, more slowly, and then I... But then you had to catch up. I had to catch up, and I just, it's my, I have a natural pace, and my apologies. I don't know what else to say. I just have to keep apologizing. Okay, questions? Yes? Could you translate that article for us? Interesting. Okay. You're adding work to my... Uh, okay, so let me see. That's an interesting idea. And I could try to do that. I mean, it would probably take time. I want to write that article on Holy Mother first. Mm -hmm. And even that is on the back burner because I'm writing a new book now on karma and rebirth in Hinduism. So anyway, uh, yes. Uh, but, but thank you. That's a good suggestion. And I, I think um, if, if, if God willing, everything is based on God's will, uh, I, I, I may very well do that. Yes, you and then you in the back. One second. Yeah, and then you also. Yeah, so please. Uh, Say your name first and then. Uh, uh, Shrikanth. Yeah, hi. Mm. And I can realize God, God motives, right? Mm. So, why is it that the why is one one uh, like you know, you know, if I feel if I, if I if I want to go one way and not the other? Yeah. So how is how is that question ever answered? And I, I know there's probably yeah. kind of setting God's work, but is it all? Yeah, no, no, I get your question. That's a good question. How do I handle that? Yeah. So I think the idea is simple. I think what our tradition says is. If you want to practice the path of knowledge and just go for your own liberation, that's perfectly fine. Do it. Nobody's going to judge you for it. But there's a special category of soul, which he calls Ishvara Kotis. This is something like the equivalent of, in the Buddhist, Buddhist tradition, the Bodhisattva. People who, even if they can attain nirvana easily on their own, they choose to renounce nirvana in order to come back again and again, take birth again and again, in order to, say, to help suffering humanity. In that sense, greater. Not in the sense that you shouldn't do it or that we're going to think that we're going to look down on you if you do it. But it's just that vast spiritual compassion that these great souls have that brings them back and, and ch makes them choose to come back to help others. That's it. It's about spiritual compassion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. We don't have a mic for these guys, huh? Okay. The question was, uh, well, okay. What's the best way to put this? OK, so in what sense is coming back from the state of samadhi and helping others superior to the state of just being immersed in the state of Nirvikalpa Samadhi, for instance, which is what the young Narin asked for from Sri Ramakrishna, and he got that scolding of his life. And so that's my answer. Next question is back there. Yeah, name first. Sri Raj Roy. Sri Raj Roy, yes, hi.
Mm-hmm. How does this practice mm. helps connect to all the things of Rama Jiko, Shankara, all the because that's yeah. what we are doing. Yeah, no, that's good. So, okay, the question is interesting. She says, uh, he, he's saying that Holy Mother often said that main, main, uh, one of her main spiritual practices that she recommended was do japa, do japa, take God's name. How does that, how does that teaching, how do we understand that in the, in the context of kind of um, harmonizing the different philosophical schools? So here's how I see it. According to Shankara school, japa is a wonderful practice. That falls under bhakti yoga. Except that, that won't take you all the way to Brahma Jnana. That helps us to purify our minds and to concentrate our minds, just as Karma Yoga does, the yoga of selfless action. But once we attain a sufficiently pure and concentrated mind, we have to stop those practices. We stop doing japa, literally. And what do we do? We take up the path of knowledge. Shravana, I'm not going to go into what, that's every lecture, most of the lectures here are about path of knowledge, so I'm not going to go into that. Now, Holy Mother, and Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda are all teaching that bhakti yoga itself is a direct path to liberation. So this is how I see the connection. When she says that through japa you can attain everything, she really means it. Japat siddhi, japat siddhi, japat siddhi. She, she, this is actually a Sanskrit teaching that she said in Sanskrit. Japat siddhi means from japa comes perfection, spiritual perfection. And she repeated three times, one of her famous teachings. That doesn't agree with classical Advaita. But she says it, because b- through bhakti you can attain even the knowledge of non-dual pure consciousness by the grace of God. So that's the harmonization. She accepts the path of jnana, she, expect, she accepts all the other yogas as well, but even through, the, even through japa, just by b- japa, which is a bhakti yoga practice, you can attain the highest. You can even attain knowledge of non-dual pure consciousness. It's not that you're just stuck with the personal God, if you want to put it that way. But you, know, but you can even get brahma jnana through the path of bhakti. This is also mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 12. Next question. Where are we? Uh, I think you also had a question first, and then and then we can go back. Yeah, didn't you? Didn't you or no? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. So go ahead, please. Uh, Name. Oh, Sri. You're also Sri. Okay, many Shri's. Mm. Um, so presumably, um, Sri Ma, all of her relatives were. Um, they must have had very good karma to be in her family. Yet none of them could really recognize her or mm. appreciate. Mm. Her niece, her, her niece's mother, mm. um, and she, as um, the same as Kapi, she, you know, with one touch, she could have mm. helped. That's interesting. Mm. At least the ones that were mentally ill. Mm. Because without those, without the mind working, mm. how could they even try to mm. ask for God? Right, um, right. That's a great question. So the question is, look, Holy Mother was God, the Divine Mother herself. She had the capacity, she was omnipotent. She could have cured her family members of mental illness and their unspiritual evil qualities if she wanted to. Why didn't she? I think that's a deep, and that's a kind of version of the problem of evil in a way. Um, and I don't want to say there's one right answer. So I mean, this is just a kind of right off the, you know, off the, off the cuff, I'm just saying one thing. But you know, w- one thing is, first of all, you have to respect the law of karma. Her family members came because of karma just as much as anybody else. Good and bad. Good and bad. And so she, you know, so she doesn't want to interfere completely. With, she can interfere. But what's the condition for interfering, for, for changing somebody's karma, remember? Is you have to take refuge in God. And the whole problem is that these family members are not taking refuge in her. Even that, as a result of their karma. And so she doesn't want to completely... T- well, oh, but I see, I mean, in that sense, if they're mentally ill, then they can't. They're not in their right mind to kind of see what's right and wrong, and then take refuge in her. That's, I mean, it's, this is a tricky question. Um, this is, you're going to say it's a cheap uh, sort of fallback, but um, in the gospel, whenever Sri Ramakrishna is faced with these kinds of difficulties, he says, Can we, with our finite human intellects, understand the ways of the inscrutable, omnipotent God? Um, yes, I'll just say that's a cop-out and escape. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, she's not letting me escape. So Sri has another follow-up. Yeah. Oh. Reminded us that she was an example. Oh. We, the rest of us, live in those conditions, perhaps. That was the reason. I'm not following. Sorry. So she was an example. Holy Mother. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing is, you know, Sri Ramakrishna also observed all sorts of daily things which you might not have expected God to observe. I mean, even things like based on the almanac. One time, 
Holy Mother and her mother walked all the way from Joyrambati to Dokineshwar to see him and spend time with him. And he said, oops, wrong day. <laughs> See ya. And then they sent, was spent one night and they, he told them to leave the next day. This is one of those things where, I mean, there are certain things where even monks are like, we can't forgive Sri Ramakrishna. This is one of them. <laughs> but anyway, so in the same way, Holy Mother also is observing certain rules and sort of, if she, if she plays too much outside the box, it'll disrupt the whole creation in a certain sense and she's not going to set as much of an, if she's too supernatural and too super, superhuman, people aren't going to be able to relate to her. Um, so that's a really nice, uh, sort of, that's better than my cop-out answer, thank you. <laughs> uh, next question. Yes, name first. Yeah. This is Ranujit. Ranujit. My question is that regarding Karma Yoga and the Catholic work, is there a little number one which do the same work but with a different results? Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. This is an interesting question. He's saying that, well, this law of karma sounds kind of fatalistic to me or deterministic because whatever we, 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 we sow, and so we don't have any control over what we do now. So if we don't do spiritual practice and we do bad things, that's not our fault. That's because of what we did in our previous life and we can <laughs> chalk it up to karma. That's an interesting question. So this raises another massive can of worms, which I didn't open because it would have taken me too far astray. But um, the problem of free will and determinism, and what are Holy Mother's views on this? Unfortunately, as I said, most of her teachings weren't recorded. And so as far as I can tell, there's some places where she hints at it, and she says everything is God's will. So that's very much in line with Sri Ramakrishna's teachings on free will, which are what? There is no free will, <laughs> which may be disappointing to some people. But there's more to it than that. I have an entire article on this called Hard Theological Determinism and the Illusion of Free Will. If you're interested, you can go to my academic website and get that. But um, the gist of it is as follows. This is Sri Ramakrishna's view, and I think Holy Mother takes the same position. There is no free will from the ultimate standpoint. But so long as we have not realized God, God has implanted in us the illusion that we are free and therefore morally responsible for our actions. Otherwise, we would have committed more sin. He says this in the Gospel. It's recorded in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Now, what if you say... Well, okay, but now you're tell you keep telling us that everything is God's will, so can't we just go and do all sorts of bad things and chalk it up to God? He says, go ahead and try, more or less. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. Because what he, what he says is, you can verbally say, God is a doer, I'm not the doer, but the moment you take the next step, you know you're the doer. So long as you have not realized God, you cannot actually internalize the teaching that God is a doer. And there and... You have to believe that you're free and therefore morally responsible for your actions, even though from the ultimate standpoint that's not true. We can't prematurely believe that because of the nature of creation, because God has created us in that way. It's like a chip in our brain that makes us feel free. Even if we just profess it verbally, that's meaningless. It's not true. And the moment we have realized God, yes, it's true. That person can commit any, any sin under the sun, but that realized soul doesn't. Why? Because that person has realized God. And God is a doer, and God will never make that person do anything evil through him. This is the beautiful philosophical uh, reconciliation that Sri Ramakrishna gives, and I think Holy Mother will say exactly the same thing. You don't know what your karma is. If we knew what our karma was and what the results of our karma were, that's one thing, but we don't. So you should act according to your best lights. So if, if somebody comes or you read a text like the Gospel or the Bhagavad Gita which says, engage in sadhana, renounce worldly pleasures and attachments, how do you know that, you, you, see, it would be fatalistic if you knew what you're, what you're about to do next, but you don't know. And that Gita has fallen into your lap, or that gospel has fallen into your lap. That's also as a result of your karma. And those teachings are telling you to engage in spiritual practices and to avoid sinful actions. Mahut Narayan, there's a story about Mahut Narayan. The, uh, many of you are familiar with this probably, but Sri used to say, there's a, a disciple of a guru, and the guru is teaching that everything is God's will. Everything is Narayana. And that, guru, that disciple is a very faithful disciple, very, very obedient. He goes off walking in the forest. He, there's a mad elephant. And the mahut, who's the one who's sort of uh, the tamer of the elephant who's sitting on top of it, shouts at the top of his lungs, get away, get away. There's a mad elephant. It's going to crush you. If... And everybody runs, flees from the village, except that one guy. And he says, everything is not iron. That means the elephant's not iron as well. 
And, he, and the elephant's coming toward him. He's sort of, no problem. The elephant comes and crushes him. Fortunately, he doesn't die, but he's really in bad shape. The guru and the disciples come rushing after him. And they see this, his pathetic situation. And then the guru says, why didn't you move out of the way? The mahut was telling you. And then he said, well, because you told me that everything's not ayana. So the elephant is also not ayana. He says, what you forgot is that the, nara, the mahut is also not ayana. So that means the Gita that comes into our life, those, those sadhus or those sincere spiritual aspirants that come into our lives and that tell us to do certain things and not other things and this is the way out of your suffering, that's also God's will. In yeah. this context, Arjuna, when he was, when he refused to fight, Krishna said, you need to have karma, you need to fight against karma. Yeah, that's actually, he doesn't say karma, it's actually swadharma is the, is the term used in the Gita. That's a very, very loaded term. And here I could, give, I, I could give a separate lecture on this, but it's very interesting. I'll just mention it briefly. Swadharma. Do your swadharma. Each one of us has his or her own swadharma. And Sri Aurobindo has a nice translation of this. Our own law of being. What makes us tick? What is our calling? It's not uh, dictated by hereditary caste. That's a kind of much later sort of thing. Our guna and our karma. In the Gita, caste is determined by guna and karma, our innate qualities, and what we do, our behavior. Right? Based on that, it's like almost like if you go to university these days, almost every university has like a career counseling office, and you talk to somebody who kind of says, hey, you know, based on your, you fill out the survey, you talk to that person, they say, I think you'd be a great lawyer for these reasons, because you love arguing and this and that. Or I think you'd be a great first grade teacher. And, you know. So in the same way, Bhagavan Krishna is saying this in the Bhagavad Gita. First step in spiritual life, know what your swadharma is. And that requires, first of all, not pretending to be something you're not, not doing things for the wrong reasons because it's prestigious, because your parents want you to do it, because society wants you to do it, but because that's really your calling, your swadharma, your own law of being. And just to make a, a contemporary connection here, how many of you have heard of Martin Seligman? He, he's, a, he's, a, he's a wonderful contemporary psychologist, one of the pioneers of what's called positive psychology, and he wrote a great book called Authentic Happiness. And the main thesis of that book is that each one of us, the first step in, in, in attaining true happiness is recognizing what are our signature strengths. That's the term he uses, signature strengths, our core strengths. Every single one of us has strengths. Every single one of us has weaknesses. Many of us are not sort of sufficiently honest with ourselves about what our strengths and weaknesses are. So brutally, self, uh, brutally honest self-assessment is the first step to true happiness. And he has this great survey, by the way. I, I, I can give you, I, we can put the link on the YouTube description later, where you can fill out the survey, and it'll tell you what your five uh, uh, top signature strengths are, and then it gives you a list of your more minor strengths. And it's really accurate. I did it myself, and it's really great. Now, why am I saying this? Because swadharma means it's, it's very much like signature strengths. Figure out what makes you tick. Figure out your strengths and weaknesses, and then you can determine your calling. And then you can do karma yoga on a, a properly spiritual basis. Because then everything you do, you can, you can offer all of your strengths, all of your talents to God. You always want to offer what's best to God, not what's mediocre. <laughs> right? Okay, that's a long answer, but yeah. What's the name of the book? Authentic Happiness by Martin Seligman. Yes, please. Uh, general question. Yeah, name first. Sunday. Yeah. Mm. It never, even in what you're saying, like there was, there isn't much literature, mm. much written about what Mahatma said. Mm. Um, how do we? And we had all the goddesses that mm. we worship, this pantheon of goddesses, mm. gods. The world was created mm. with fe we shall say female forms. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Etc. How do you? I find that. Yeah. Like Mm. Blah blah blah. But when you have people who have realized souls mm. who still have that, maybe it's like a change in time, and we view women differently today. Mm. And, you know, but at that time too, we were all souls. So why was it different? Yeah, this is a very very uh, important question. Um, on the one hand, Hindu Hinduism has always worshipped Divine Mother and God in the form of Divine Mother. And on the other hand. From a social standpoint, women have 
always seem to have occupied a kind of subordinate position vis-a-vis -vis men in Indian society? Is that, that's the question, right? And isn't that a contradiction? I mean, one thing I'll say is, yes, that is a contradiction. And I think Swami Vivekananda was very forthright about this. And, he, and, and there's a place where he says in one letter, he says, he says, Hinduism is this, there's something very paradoxical about Hinduism, because on the one hand, it talks in the loftiest strains about the divinity of human beings. And on the other hand, Hinduism is one of the worst culprits when it comes to trampling underfoot the poor and the downtrodden. And I think one can say the same thing about women in society in that way. And that's part of the reason for the advent of Sri Ramakrishna. Before Sri Ramakrishna, which male gave a woman the authority to give diksha? And, and, and he said, you will be doing far more work than me. And she did. And she initiated thousands more people than Sri Ramakrishna himself did. He was a, he was a kind of proto-feminist in that way. So that's a short answer. Thank you. Uh, I, I think we have to wrap it up soon, right? But yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Or, or you tell me. I don't know. I'm, I'm fine, but yeah. Five more minutes. How about that? So it's not too abrupt. Yeah, please. Name, for, name first. Amran. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. The great question is if we don't have free will, then what about all these people coming and telling us in scriptures, sadhus, monks tell us that you can realize God in this very life? Again, I'll say the main thing is we don't know what our karma is. So each one, we have to assume that it's possible for us to realize God in this life because we don't know any better. That, that would be the answer. And you'll see that the more spiritual practice, you, if, you, if you take one step, this is another teaching which, you know, one thing is, I wonder whether it's in, I tried to track this teaching down, but I can't find it. This is often attributed to Sri Ramakrishna, and I, I bet we can find it somewhere, but I haven't been able to find it. If you take one step towards God, God will take ten steps towards you. Um, if anyone here knows, does anyone know, is it in Lila Prashanga or what? I don't know. It's definitely not there, as far as I'm aware, because I know that text inside and out, and I've been looking for it all over the place. But, but I think it might be in Lila Prashanga, but I'm not sure. In any case, it seems as if he had said that, but even if he hadn't said it, I think it's true. You do what is in your ability now, from what you understand, with your limited mind, and you, sh I mean, you can't possibly assume that you're not meant to realize God in this life, because what, what evidence do you have for that? <laughs> what could you possibly say about that? Oh, I'm just an ordinary person. Each one of us is divine. That's what Vedanta says. And how do you know what you're capable of until you actually go uh, do something? <laughs> do something, and then you can take the next step, and God herself will open the next step for you and clear the path for you. Yeah. Ty. Uh, Ty. So <clears throat> based on what you said just a moment earlier, if our aspiration is towards God and you know, our uh, thinking and our actions, etc., yet when we sit Mm. And one is in the light and that. And there's many techniques. Yeah. You could explain, <coughs> do a mantra. <coughs> but but uh, when uh, that doesn't happen, how do you reconcile with that? Reconcile what with what? How do you reconcile that the mind is not at ease, mm. not able to focus on? But reconciliation requires X and Y. So X has to be reconciled with Y. But what is X and Y here? Uh, you can reframe the question if you want, but I, I just, I'm just trying to figure out what your question is. Right, no, my question mm. is if one aims towards, uh, you know, focusing... Oh, right, if that's your aim, to concentrate on God, and you're having difficulty doing so because your mind is restless, Correct. then... Oh, how do, you, oh, oh, how do you explain that? Is that? How do you explain it, or how do you get beyond that? Okay, I mean, this is a question for your guru, and not for a, a poor old monk like me. Um, so I'd recommend that you speak to more senior monks, um, this is a very common question all of us have. I have it, you know, so, um, so I don't feel like I'm qualified to answer it. But the, a general answer is that there are many different ways to help you calm the mind, and it's useful to kind of learn different techniques to do so and, f and see what sticks, you know. I mean, <laughs> um, and that's true of many things in spiritual life, is that there's not one way but many ways. And the guru, the reason why I say guru is because that, the guru knows you much better than you know yourself. So only the guru can really based on your own temperament, tell you which of these many strategies, practices, will best help you. So, sorry, that's a non-answer, but there's a reason for it, as I said. Yeah. 
Uh, anyone else? One more, one, more. one more question. Going once, going twice. That's Vigyana. OK, thank you all. Swamiji, um, on behalf of everybody, thank you so much. And I think this is, could have gone on even longer. <laughs> um, but the good news is that you will be coming back to talk about your new book. Uh, eventually. I mean, I haven't even started writing the book, so don't, oh, okay. don't, don't expect any time soon. Yeah. Well, you, you have time. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you all so much. And thanks for your patience again. It's a long lecture. <laughs>